So, um, Tizen Core UI APIs. This is for developers. If you're not a developer, it might be a little bit difficult to follow. Um, so, Tizen UI. Core APIs. This is for native development and for developers. So within the Tizen core APIs, there are several libraries or API sets that handle different things. Uh, one of this is the app core library, handles the core of your application, some initialization stuff, um, lifecycle management, some callbacks, etc. Um, multimedia library, there's a messaging library as well to handle messages. There's a player library for some multimedia playback, so you can write little music players, etc. And in addition to that is the UI. It is another library. There's also others as well. Um, so I'll be covering the UI. So the UI parts at their base are either X11 or Wayland. X is a very old and mature display system. It's been around for about 30 years now, give or take. Um, it, we use the modern features in X11, um, in addition, of course, to some old ones. We use compositing, so you can get fancy zoom effects, semi-transparency between things, like different windows or dialogues. Um, we also use the shared memory for cutting down copies, um, of course, the Core X stuff, and the OpenGL um, DRM, DRI, rendering stack as well. Now, Wayland, in comparison to X, is much newer. Um, it's l much less mature, still being fleshed out. Uh, it is much slimmer. There's a lot less in Wayland. It does far, far less. The Wayland universe only does compositing, where X11 can do either compositing or not. Um, it has different ways of transporting buffers from your client to your compositor. There is always a compositor. Um, so you can either use shared memory to transport your buffers or pixels across, or you can use your DRM or DMA buff buffers where you'd often have the GPU render to those, and on the other end, you would use them as, for example, texture sources. So, oh, yep. on, oops, you missed it. On top of this base display, there's the web runtime. So basically, the web runtime is a big browser, uh, minus the Chrome, minus the URL bars, etc. And that's where you get your JavaScript, HTML, CSS, etc. for your applications. Also, in parallel to being able to use a web runtime, there is native development. You can write your programs in C or C++. Um, that all the APIs as of Tizen 2.3 um, are native C APIs. Um, we actually have deprecated the C++ um, API set that we had. So, and these are the APIs I was discussing earlier. And the UI toolkit is actually EFL. It's called EFL. It's version 1.7. And the original upstream project is at enlightenment.org. So that's where it sits in the stack for people who love block diagrams. Um, it's pretty much sitting in the middle. Even the web runtime itself depends on EFL to get stuff onto the screen or to get input as well from input devices and so on. So who am I to talk about this? My name is Carsten Heitzler. I, in fact, did in, live here in the Bay Area uh, back during the last dot-com boom, uh, back in like 98, 99, 2000 or so. Um, I am now a principal engineer at Samsung Electronics. I have actually been there for four years. I've been working on Tizen and what was Tizen before that for now about six and a half years. Um, so before I actually moved there full-time, I was a consultant, and I also worked on the same OS stack. So I've done a lot with this platform, and I might know one or two little things here or there. I actually am the founder of EFL, or the Enlightenment Project. I have written quite a large amount of its code over the years, so I know a few things there. Um, if you have questions, if you have any questions, please ask those, because the best way to get your answers or to learn things is to, in fact, ask questions. I can invariably really answer those um, because I've been there or done that quite often. So please, ask questions. So what is EFL? It stands for Enlightenment Foundation Libraries. 
I did not actually come up with a name. A bunch of French people came up with that name. Sometimes people joke it's called the Enlightenment French libraries because there's so many French developers involved. Um, these libraries, much like GTK, were created while building another application. That application happened to be Enlightenment. Um, we built them because we needed features that did not exist anywhere else. Um, we looked around, we couldn't really recycle anything. They were made as separate libraries, so not included inside an application and just part of the binary, because we thought maybe they're useful to someone else. Um, so they got released separately, and lo and behold, they did actually end up being useful to lots of other people, and they end up being useful to Tizen. While doing the development, we kept in mind not just to develop them for the Linux desktops and laptops that we used, but to also aim for embedded. In fact, back then, Ed EFL was running on things like the little compact iPack, a 200 meg 206 megahertz ARM PDA back then with only 64 meg of RAM. Uh, so that was often like the test bed. It's created by and maintained by a fairly small focused team. It doesn't have a massive amount of developers on it. It's pretty small. Um, and that means they focus on the core and they're not necessarily adding millions of features all day long. They're focusing on a very specific, smaller feature set. It is all 100% open source. From top to bottom, inside out, everything is developed the open source way. Um, it's done actually as an independent project outside of Tizen. Tizen pulls it in and then does fixes. In fact, those fixes go back upstream, etc. cetera. Um, so if you want to see the code at any time, even code that's not in Tizen yet, it's available today. Um, there are no mysteries in this. So there's about a million lines of C code in that toolkit. Um, the reason it's a library set or a toolkit is to save you writing those million lines of code yourself um, if you ever need that amount of feature set. Okay, it won't save you a million lines of code in your app, but it'll save you something. Uh, within those libraries, it's not just a single library. There are multiple. Each library covers a different domain. It has a different task in life. At the very higher level, one that a lot of people will see the most is elementary. Elementary is a widget set or toolkit. You get all your normal widgets. It also wraps a lot of things below it and gets rid of na near na uh, nasty little details. So you can do things more easily with less code. Evis is a scene graph. Um, scene graphs are all the rage today. Um, all the toolkits are doing it. In fact, most modern web browsers internally have become scene graphs. They actually have a whole scene graph layer. Um, everyone's doing this, and EFL's actually been doing scene graphs for well over a decade now, um, so it's fairly mature. Ecore is the core of things like the main loop infrastructure, event, uh, event, like shuffling events over from the main loop to a bunch of callbacks. It deals with animation. The animators there uh, will actually do vSync. That means they'll be synchronized to your screen refresh and be called at exactly screen refresh time if you use them. And there's also timers. You can get the current time point, et cetera. Ena is just data structures. Of course, since it is a C library set, you don't have something like STL. So you need linked lists. You need hash tables. You need all this stuff. Ena provides all of those, and we use those. These are also, of course, available to anyone outside. Edge is an abstracted layout library where you can just create a data file that describes your layout. This is to the right of that. This is below that. This is hooked to this. Um, and so when that object resizes or you send it signals, it'll automatically animate, automatically change its layout by itself based on a data file. You don't need to write code to do it. And there are other libraries too which take care of other domains, but they're the main ones you'll probably see. Um, EFL is main loop centric. It has a very specific design ethos, which is your main loop is the state engine of your application. It's a state machine. That's what holds your UI state, what is where at any point in time. Um, and it handles transition, tra transitioning of that state from one property to another. For example, this goes from red to green. That means that all the code that's expected to run from the main loop is generally not thread safe. It's intended to only run from that main loop and be called there. For example, the scene graph, um, elementary, Evis, Edge, and so on. The design tries to encourage you to move 
any work that needs to be done that would take too long to do in a main loop, anything that might block in I.O., block in doing a lot of calculation, etc., move them to child threads. And those child threads should, when they're done and they finish their work, message back to the main loop. All the infrastructure for doing that messaging is provided for you already. You just create a, in this case, an eCore thread. You give it a call back to say this, call, this function is called in the thread. And when it's done, this function collects its result. And that function is then called in the main loop, collects the result, which is a void pointer, um, and then can implement that result in the UI. For example, add some items to a list or change the color of an object or shuffle some pixels somewhere. Um, so this also includes a whole thread worker API. If any of you know Mac OS X or Mac OS X, it's a bit like Grand Central Dispatch, and that's already built in. Um, so it'll create N worker threads for you, have a queue, and if you create more of these things, they just get put on a queue and will get executed, uh, get executed when one of the workers becomes available. So that's all handled for you. So since it decides to keep things separate in separate threads, not like you create one thread for every little thing you want to do, but only for big tasks, and then you get the messages back to the main loop, it encourages to, you to isolate your work. So when you're going and preparing a bunch of data in a thread, that, that thread is isolated and all its data is local. This tends to lead to better performance because you don't have to worry about locking lots and lots of data structures and other objects that you're sharing all the time. And it also then leads to less bugs because you don't have any weird, I forgot to lock this issues with your data or certain objects or widgets, et cetera, et cetera. It makes your life a lot easier. You have known state transitions from one state to another. So it will result in you having better code. And thus, the toolkit tries to push you into that design. Trying to fight against it is going to be very, very hard. You can, but it's easier to go with the flow. So if you were to use threading, you'd have your main loop on the right there, and that would just continuously come around. Every time it wakes up, it'll wake up, go and handle events, call the functions that handle those events, all in line, all the other timing stuff, etc. It will then go and actually update the user interface, do the rendering and evaluate for you. You don't actually have to render. It's just done in the background. Um, once the state, the event goes back to, the event loop goes back to sleep. And if you want to do work in threads, you would be doing them in threads. On the left-hand side there, there is the worker queue and the workers or the thread queue, the workers will happily pick up some item from that queue whenever they become available. And when they're done, message back to the main loop. You can actually create custom threads to do the same thing. So you don't have to use the worker pool. Um, but generally speaking, you probably want to use the pool. So elementary, that provides all your widgets, your buttons, your scrollers, your entries, uh, checkboxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty much all the widgets you could need or want are provided there. Um, you don't have to go implement your own. So go and use them whenever you need such features. You can, in fact, mix and match high level and low level objects. So you can create your own objects in different ways, like your own widgets, build them out of other elements. So elementary code would look like that. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to stuff code onto a slide. Um, and make it easy to read. I hope you can read that. Um, it's fairly simple. You would cre just create a window, set some states for, in this case, set it to automatically delete. Um, for example, if someone presses a little close button in the top right, or they would happen to hit the back button to exit the application, or use the task manager to close it. Um, that means that object automatically deletes. You would just show the window once, cre once created, show it, then create a box. You go and put that box into the window after setting some properties on it. For example, this box is allowed to expand. You make it the resize object for the window and just show that. And then repeat for every single thing. It's very, very simple. Um, you just go create, pack into a parent, set some properties, show it, and so on, until your UI is done. And then you'll just get an application that looks pretty much like what's on the top right there. Um, it's pretty simple. And of course, that isn't really the full application. The full one's a little bit bigger. There's a little bit of extra fluff. 
in order to make this work. But not a lot else. There's a call back there for the button, so if, if the button is clicked, it calls that function, which basically exits the application there. Um, the scene graph is Evis. In Evis, you do not render, you don't draw, you create. It's a very, very different way of working to what a lot of people are used to. Um, this is often termed retain mode rendering, where how to render something is kept inside a data structure rather than you continuously executing this all the time. Um, so what you do is you say, I want a box over here. On top of the box, I want some text. I want this text to be pink. I want the box to be blue. Then you can show the box, hide the box, um, show the text, hide the text, change the string, which is used, change the font, change the size, the colors, etc. And when you just do these changes, these changes are automatically evaluated for you once you go idle and rendered for you. You don't have to actually know how to render anything. You just describe your world. In some ways, that looks a lot like HTML, where you have markup that describes your page. You have a div, or you have like a paragraph, you have a form entry, etc. Um, this is done very similarly in native code. So you, know, you don't actually bother caring about redraw. For example, in Android, you have to, last I knew anyway, um, you actually have to give it update regions. Say, this region of my window or my, my display surface has to update. You don't have to do that with a scene graph in Evis that is automatically calculated for you. And it does nice things, like if there is a button and it is obscured by a big solid rectangle or image, and that button was to change, it will automatically turn that into a no-op because it'll find out that during evaluation that button is hidden and even though it changed that doesn't need to be rendered so it'll just go and do nothing. It'll do these optimizations for you and you don't have to worry or care in your code. So this saves you working out this optimization in your actual application itself and lets you get on with basically writing dumb code um, and focus on the functionality of your application not trying to optimize it everywhere. The only catch is that the more objects you have, the more expensive evaluation is. And the more expensive evaluation is, the more time it takes. So thus, you should probably try and keep the number of objects you have to a minimum. Objects you don't really need anymore, delete them. Um, you can go recreate them later. It, it's not really that expensive to do. So don't keep more objects around than you need. So your scene graph will look rough, rough, uh, roughly like that. It will be a series of objects at the top level that will be stacked on top of each other, one on top, within each object that can have children. Smart objects have children. Um, and widgets are implemented as smart objects, thus they have children. Um, so within the children, they are stacked too, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the tree. Um, so your world, your whole window is built from a bunch of objects like this. So every object has some sort of geometry, x, y, width, height. It has some position, some stacking hierarchy that includes having a z layer. So if it's a top level object, they're by default they're in layer zero. And you can have more layers, like layer one is above layer zero, layer two is above layer one, etc. Layer minus one is below layer zero. And that keeps the stacking absolute. So if you raise or lower an object, it'll be raised and lowered within its layer. It won't go out of its layer. Um, so you're guaranteed an object on layer 100 is always above things on uh, layers 99, 98, and everything below. The smart objects, they of course will hold the children. Within a smart object, there are no layers. So when you raise, it'll raise to the top of the smart object or lower to the bottom of the smart object, but not outside of it. So using this stacking, you can get certain effects you would normally require inheriting a class and implementing a bunch of code to do. You instead just take two objects, stack one on top of the other, and then you can get the effect of having like two combined objects just by a bit of stacking. Um, it does make life easy, but you have to change a little bit how you think and how you arrange things rather than using traditional inheritance to do it. So we generally tend to compose objects rather than inherit and override. So all the widgets are done by composing. So rendering. In fact, actually, I did say you can't render. You actually can. A lot of people keep asking about wanting to render. Um, so 
There are ways to do it. It's generally discouraged because once you start rendering, you're in charge of trying to make your rendering optimized yourself. No one is doing that work for you. If you wanted to do a lot of vector rendering, draw some pie charts, some et cetera, et cetera, like little uh, da, 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 graphs with nice little lines, et cetera, then you might want to use something like Cairo. Cairo is one of those APIs supported in the native core API set. And you would just basically choose an image object as the target. An image object is just a blob of pixels somewhere in memory. Um, you can normally, with image objects, you go and say, here's a file. It's this file on disk. Go and load that. And all the loading is done for you. Decoding is done for you. The memory management is done all for you. In this case, you would use an image object just as a raw bunch of empty pixels and go and render to it with Cairo. Um, so all you do is you wrap a Cairo surface around the image object. You can also use a thread to do this if Cairo is taking a little bit too long. Um, if you're going to use a thread, double buffer, use two image objects, show, the, show one and hide the other, render to the hidden one until it's ready and then show that and hide the one that was there before. Um, and when you're done rendering, just throw out the Cairo surface. It's nothing but a little data structure that just points to the memory. Um, so it's very cheap to create and delete. And then just when that's done, set the pixel data back. I, you check out the data, you get it, which is like checking out from the library. You do this, you set it back to return your book to the library, return your pixels, and just tell it which regions of that image you updated. That's all. Um, so in that way, it does look a little bit more like the Android thing. Um, but this is where you do your own rendering. You can, in fact, not just use Cairo. You can use the same technique for any custom data you want to render. So if you have, I don't know, for example, a machine emulator that generates pixels by hand, you can use the same technique and generate your 32-bit ARGB pixels all by yourself. So here's a small example that uses Cairo plus EFL. Just get the data, get the image size in pixels, um, get the stride, number of bytes per line, wrap a Cairo surface around that, create the surface, go do your normal Cairo stuff in the middle there, go and delete it, get set the data back, and add your updates. Not very difficult, pretty simple. A uh, more full example, you can actually compile and run that, and it works. Um, is there. The purple bit is the code I was just showing you. I'm terribly sorry it's small. Um, I can give you this presentation so you can get the actual details out of it. These are actual source files that I compiled and wrote specifically for this, so um, they work. Um, ask me at the end, uh, later at the end of this and I can make sure I get it to you. And a lot of people ask about OpenGL. They want to do OpenGL. They must do OpenGL. You know, game developer or I don't know, your people who've written your own scene graph using OpenGL. Um, and you can actually use OpenGL within the scene graph. You can do this without using copies. I highly suggest you use the GLView widget, which handles a bunch of footwork for you, makes it very, very easy. Um, what you basically do by doing this is you put commands into the rendering of the canvas. There are limits, and these limits are there to avoid context switching and to avoid copies. So all of this can actually work without any extra copies. You're not going to render to, for example, to an FBO and then copy that yet again. Copies can be very, very, very expensive, especially on embedded devices, um, especially at the resolutions we have these days. Um, that's a lot of memory to shuffle around, um, and it's not cheap. It can literally halve your frame rate if you're doing a copy. So avoiding the copies is really good. Um, this also allows your 3D rendering to even have its own alpha channel. That means it can be transparent on top of existing scene graph content, an existing background image, existing background widgets or lists. Not just that, but you can also overlay things on top of the GL. So if you want to do some debugging, like add a little rate counter at the top in text, if you had to do that in GL, it is very, very, very hard to just draw some text in GL. You've got to go use free type, render to some memory, upload to a texture, go use that texture, render a bunch of triangles, query the font extents per glyph, etc., and lay out your own text by hand. It's really painful. 
if instead you just use a normal text object where you just set the text and walk away and someone else does that for you, it makes life really easy to add debugging or for games, add your HUD, your overlays and all the other status on top. It saves you a lot of time and effort. So you can combine your normal full-blown 3D rendering along with other scene graph elements to go and save you time and effort. Um, but yeah, there's an example. Um, the downside is that the whole G OpenGL API is in fact wrapped inside a structure. That's the GL, um, in this case the EversGL API structure. All those are function pointers to either a real function or to a wrapped function that does a little bit of footwork for you um, and handles some context goop, etc., context tracking. So that's the slight difference. You can turn that into a macro if you want, um, but it's very easy to port or write your GL code. Uh, but you always provide a draw function, and the draw function then is called during the rendering of the scene graph in the main loop. That's how you can get zero copy. The actual complete code for GL is there. You really don't need to read that. Um, doing GL is quite a lot of work because you've got to do actual shaders and everything else. So um, that's, again, a full example. But the actual core of it is very small, as I just showed you. So what's coming in the future? The moment Tizen 2 is what is shipping on things like the Gear 2, the, um, the Gear S, that's shipping Tizen 2.3, um, if I'm not mistaken. And, well, we've got a bunch of cameras, but you can't develop apps for that, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but those are the current things that are shipping. They're Tizen 2. Tizen 3 is being worked on at the moment. So Tizen 2 is using EFL 1.7. EFL's already up to release 1.11. 1.12 actually came out on Monday, so it's several releases ahead. Um, the 1.7 release is now about two years old, so the Tizen 2 is a little bit on the old and creaky side. So Tizen 3 is tracking upstream to a certain extent, so Tizen 3 will have a much newer version of EFL with a lot of nice new shiny features. Um, so as Tizen migrates to newer versions of EFL, these will go into Tizen. So if you want to see what's coming, look at Upstream. If you want to affect what's going to be in Tizen, participate in Upstream. This is not, Tizen is not a consume-only OS. It's an OS of collaboration, where if there's something you need or you want, go and have a talk to the developers. Participate in Upstream development. Um, be part of it. Of course, you can define what goes into Tizen as well as just consume it. So watch upstream if you want to know. So lots of improvements that have gone in. We've added object infrastructure of our own. It's a bit like G-Object, if anyone knows what that is. Um, it's our own OONC. It does a lot of interesting things. Um, objects all runtime safe. You can never crash accessing an object. They're, in fact, abstract IDs. They're no longer pointers. Um, so it's all runtime safe, much like JavaScript or Lua, but now done in C. And now C++ APIs, bindings, Lua, Python, and JavaScript are all first-class bindings. They're not done by some separate team or developers manually you know, exporting one function at a time. It's literally all automatically generated. There's a tool that just goes through the original APIs and auto-generates all the bindings. Um, the way this OO is done is done specifically to make it very, very easy and clean to generate bindings. So the way we did objects before in C, we did actually do objects, is we just have a pointer to a structure. This is very similar to what you get in things like both Qt and GTK. All your widgets are really just pointers to data and memory, whether it's all pointers to C++ objects. And so what we used to have before is we'd also have a pointer to an object. When you had that pointer, the first thing we did is we dereferenced the pointer, looked at the first four bytes or the first int of the object and checked if there's a magic number there, a magic series of bytes that tells you both if the object is valid and if it is, well, what type of object it is. And that number is not a common number like zero or one. It's some relatively random string of bits. So we'd go and actually check that and if it's valid, we would then go and continue accessing an object. If not, we'd return. Slight problem is that if the pointer to your object is invalid, it's a bunch of garbage data, you've already deleted it somewhere else and you're still passing this pointer around, you would crash when accessing that magic number. 
We got a lot of complaints for developers who don't understand that when this access is happening, the problem is the pointer you're passing in, not the code that's crashing. The code that's crashing is trying to protect you, but it can't. So after a lot of that, we no longer do that. Instead, now we have a bunch of indirection. Um, that pointer now is still a pointer for ABI compatibility purposes, but it's now split up into table ID, um, no, table number, table entry number, and a generation count. And we go and look that up in an actual table, which is kept away from normal memory. It's actually mem mapped somewhere else, so it's very hard to accidentally scribble over. And then if that row in that table, or that table exists at all, and the row in the table has a non-null entry, then we have a valid object and we go and access it from there. It's a little bit more work, but it is a lot safer. The same is the case for method calls. Every method or function call may or may not be valid for that object type. And it depends now on what inherits from, which classes it inherits from, etc. And so for every method call, we actually do a runtime lookup. If that method isn't supported, it just becomes a no-op. It happily skips it and marches on. It's safe. So you'll just get a complaint and no crashes. So in that way, it's very much like a dynamic language, but now done in C. So the OO version of this, which is coming, it will actually be the standard API as of EFL2, which is still a little bit down the road. But it's usable today as in addition to the existing C API. Um, you would just create an object, giving it its class. You always give it a parent. Null is a perfectly valid parent. Um, you would then say, call these methods on this object. You can, in fact, do multiple method calls on the same object, because that saves dereferencing that object pointer multiple times. You only difference once for those end calls. Um, and that's what it looked like in C. And in C++, it's exactly the same API. And this is one for one mapped, and there is in fact a C++ API auto generated. So if you prefer C++, you get exactly the same thing. And you will in fact get the same thing with JavaScript, Lua, and Python as well. So we've also already to this date, we've added 3D objects. An object, you just point it to a mesh on disk and say, hey, load this mesh. And it'll happily do that. It can do a whole scene graph of 3D nodes inside of there. We are in the middle of working on adding vector objects as first class. We already have filters on text. Let's show some examples there. In fact, that filter on the right with the flames, those flames can actually be animated and happily burning there, and the text will waver with like a heat shimmer and everything else, the flames going up, and it works. It will work actually on any text anywhere in your application. Um, so you can just apply a filter and presto, it works. It's a standard text object but well, with a filter applied. Um, so that's already there. We've been adding um, GUI Builder. That's called Erigo. So that's so you can go and put your widgets together, and it goes and code generates everything for you. There is a, what you see is what you get, design editor called Inventor. So if you just do a, dis uh, a file description of your layout, which is actually done in text, you can also have an instant preview on the right. Um, and they actually interact both ways. So you select things on the left and it'll jump to the appropriate place in the text on the right and so on, etc. cetera. Um, we've done a lot of optimizations. We've done a lot of code cleanups. We also have a lot of Mac and Windows support these days. So a slight positive of writing your native Tizen apps is that you will actually get portability to both Windows, Mac, as well as regular Linux desktop as well. Um, so there, there is a nice bit there, uh, and in the native world, you don't write for Tizen and only Tizen on the UI side. So if you want to have features in Tizen, the best way to do that is work with Upstream, talk to Upstream, be part of the development, ask questions, submit patches, etc that unlike as Tizen as a whole, we have all these developers who want to work on a very, very large OS, the upstream will be focused on a specific area, and that's the area of expertise. And so if you interact with them, you can get your stuff in. It's not that difficult. We're always open for suggestions, feedback, and everything else, patches, so please send. Any questions, answers, anything else? Thank you very much. 
Questions, answers, small furry animals. Yes, small furry animals. Throwing any? No. Okay, question. <laughs> We do have test suites. They're not covering everything, though, at this stage. It's actually relatively small. There is a larger test suite which we're waiting to put into the tree. There's a couple of thousand tests in that. Um, it hasn't been merged yet. So they, yeah. Right now, upstream, there's not. There is a separate test suite which I've been waiting now for two years to be submitted. Um, I've been, people have been telling me, we've got a test suite, we've done it, and we're saying, where's the patch? And we're still waiting for the patch. Um, so that, that, that patch is sitting in the hands of a bunch of developers, and we are waiting on it. Um, and the reason why we're not working on tests is these other guys over here say they have thousands of tests. Why will we write some when they have them? Um, so we're waiting on it at the moment. Um, at the moment, we do testing in that if you've done something, you know the things that that would affect. If you know the things that would affect, you go test them. Um, since there are applications written that use EFL, you just go and run those applications and they should be using that bit there. So I know when I modify it, I do test it. I, there's always some app, some test tool, something that exercises that API. So I go and run those and see what happens. But in the, at the same token, you don't necessarily always need the test suite. That's what users are for. Um, because it's an open source project, what happens is your patch goes in, and then all the developers, which is hundred, about 100 developers, are probably checking it out from Git every single day, and they're using the code themselves every single day. So what happens is someone wakes up like me and goes, oh, that's broken and I just do a quick big git bisect, I find the commit that did it, and then I either go, oh, that's a quick fix, or I go, oh, that's bad, revert, um, and it goes out. So bugs get found pretty quickly because there's a bunch of humans actually continuously testing this. We're using this toolkit for our own desktops every single day. Um, so if something bad goes wrong, we generally tend to find it. And that's the developers who are doing it many times a day. Like they're literally doing a git pull, a rebuild, two, three, ten times every single day. There's users who are doing this too. There's several thousand of those who are continuously pulling and testing. So sometimes something slips by and then a few days later, someone pops up and says, hey, this broke since the last time I updated earlier this week. So there is a lot of testing going on there. Um, so generally speaking, and also if you want to submit a patch, there is a review process. Um, you submit a patch to review and actual developers will read the code. And what they'll do is they'll say, whoa, wait, 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 that's going to break this, this, and this. Because they know the code and they can probably see the bug from a mile off. So, but we're waiting on our big fat test suite. <laughs> um, we're waiting for the patch. There's one exists, but it's not there yet. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Well, we support 32 bits per pixel, but that is, oh, more than that, no. No, <laughs> sorry. We, we support 32 bits per pixel, including alpha channel. Um, so that means 8888. Uh, we don't have anything beyond that. Um, to date, I haven't really had a use case. Um, one of the reasons is that we, on the rendering side, we do both OpenGL and software rendering. Doing high color with software is going to be pretty expensive. Um, all our algorithms are optimized for ARGB 888 32-bit. Um, with OpenGL, we would need special extension support for specific high-color textures, i.e. floating, floating point textures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we could do it, but it's a bit expensive and we don't really have the use cases to date. But again, if someone has the use cases and has a reason to do it, talk about it, discuss it, ask questions, tell, you know, say why you need it, your use cases, submit patches, and convince the people who are there to add the support, et cetera, et cetera. It would be easy to add the support in a very naive way, which would be we'd support a new color space for images, and that means, uh, let's say, 16 bits per RGBA, so 64-bit, and we'd just write a dumb conversion function which would slap it down to 32-bit, and thus you can put in your high color support and then it all goes away. And then it's a matter after that of filling in the pipeline from there all the way to the screen. But to date, we have no embedded hardware ourselves that does anything more than 32 bits per pixel. 
On desktops, there are desktop GPUs which can do 30 bits for red, green, blue. And that means they drop the alpha. There's no alpha. But that's as good as it gets that I have seen. I know that there is really special case, highly specialized hardware that can do it, but it's not the common case. So it hasn't really become, quote, quote, a business case or a real life case to solve yet. Um, if you really, really need high color, there are cases for this, things like GIMP or Photoshop, um, et cetera, which might render in it. What they do is they do their own client side 16 bits for RGBA, and when they're done, they take that, convert to 32 bit with dithering, and then provide those pixels. And you could do that today, no problem. But you would be keeping a, you'd be keeping a 64 bit shadow in your own memory, messing with that on your CPU side, and then converting back to 32 bit for display purposes. So right now, that can work. Um, but unless you can get high color all the way through to the frame buffer and then from frame buffer all the way through to your actual screen, it hasn't really become a need to go and address. But we could do it. Since it's a scene graph, it's just another object, in this case an object with a different bit depth and then fill in all the bits in between. Yes? Um, the, okay, um, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Um, you can do your development in JavaScript, HTML5. There will always be a cost you pay for that. For example, memory footprint. The minimum memory footprint for something that's using um, today on Tizen that's using the web engine in Tizen 2 is about 35 to 40 meg. They do, you don't even leave home without spending that memory. You can't do that. The minimum footprint for a native app is like 200K. So if you want to run on a very low end device, something like a gear, that only has 512 meg of memory. It doesn't take long before your web apps, you've got two of them there, you're beginning to run low on memory. Once you add all the other bits that are involved, your native apps, you can stretch that to two, five, 10 times as many um, due to that. So memory footprint is a price you pay. But on the other side, you get ease of development, you get portability to everything that has a browser, um, you're using a high-level language JavaScript which saves you time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, there's a, you, you get these things, but there is a price you pay. Startup time. Most of the web run, our web runtime last I knew takes somewhere in the region of at least about one second to start. Um, depending on your device and your hardware, up to about four seconds. A native app starts in like 100 milliseconds from not, in like nothing, like cold. Um, maybe 200 milliseconds on a really low end piece of hardware and less the higher up you go. So again, startup times, you win. Um, so if you want interactivity, I use a start something and it's there, now works. Your native app is going to always beat the web app by a very large margin. Um, if you do a lot of calculation and computing. Um, you, you would be wanting to do that in native. If today, at the absolute best, the best benchmarks I've seen for JavaScript is a factor of two over native. That means it'll take twice as long to do the same work, and that's on an absolute best case scenario for doing compute, doing actual JavaScript stuff. Um, so if you do a lot of compute, you're going to be paying like a 100% overhead for using JavaScript at the absolute best. And no matter how much people work on that, there will always be something. ASM.js helps, but there's still overhead. So with native, you can save that. Um, you can be faster. They're the positives of native, or at least the ones I can think of straight off the top of my head. Um, yeah, <laughs> they're the major ones. So I'm sure give me time and conversation, I can dig up probably another dozen or two. Um, but it's always a trade-off. Um, no such thing as a free lunch. So, yeah. Uh, um, that's actually why this is not in Tizen today. That's why what we're doing is we're actually working on a JavaScript runtime for, that uses EFL. That means you have JavaScript as a language. All your APIs are called from JavaScript, but the rest of everything below that is native. So in effect, it would be like taking a web browser, 
stripping out most of the web bits, except the JavaScript, Java, uh, JavaScript engine, and some APIs, I guess like WebGL, or um, uh, some of the web workers and other things like that, stripping it down to that effectively. Um, and then that means you have a much smaller memory footprint, a still a much smaller startup time, but you still get some of the overhead if you've got compute. So there, we are working on that. That's not in Tizen today. Um, but that's kind of designed as more of a middle ground of you want some of the ease of development of a dynamic language like JavaScript, but you want the leanness in other respects of native. So, and that's also why we're also looking at doing it for Python and Lua as well. Lua could be a better target there in that Lua JIT is insanely fast. It is probably the fastest JIT around, end of story. Um, it beats most, it beats V8 pretty handily. Um, and it is really tiny. Lua as a language is much smaller than JavaScript. Like Lua JIT's about 150K worth of library. Whereas V8's like three or four meg worth of it. So memory footprint wise, that means you spend less on actual code. The startup time, you need to load less in memory, I.O. wise, and so on. So we're, trying, we're doing these middle grounds. And that might be, mean you can recycle JavaScript from both sides, at least core logic JavaScript. And interface stuff will probably change then. So you'll maybe create some JavaScript generator where you generate different bits of JavaScript, but hash include the, the middle bits or something. Sounds evil. <laughs> hash includes in JavaScript. That it? Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good day.